All right, good morning. Good to see you again. We have got a busy morning ahead of us. We have four festivals to do in two sessions. And because yesterday um, we had three sessions and we did two festivals. So you can see that the pressure is on a little bit. So I'd like us to turn again, please, if we could, to Leviticus chapter 23. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. And hopefully in this session, we're going to look at the Feast of Pentecost and we'll also look at the Feast of Trumpets. So we're going to try and do two feasts here. And then in the second session, we'll do the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And we'll do two feasts in that one. So beginning in Leviticus 23 and verse 15, it says this, And ye shall count unto you from the morning after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, Seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat or meal offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, and their meal offering, and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout all your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger i am the lord your god and the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel and saying in the seventh month in the first day of the month shall you have a sabbath a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. So first of all, the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And so after uh, we're told, um, after the first fruits, they were to count seven Sabbaths. And of course, that's seven sevens. That's 49 days. And then the morning after that Sabbath, that's 50, right? When I went to school, anyway, may not be any more, but back then it was uh, seven, seven, 49 plus one is 50. Okay. And so 50 days after the waving of the sheath, which is Christ in resurrection, something new is going to be introduced, right? 50 days after. We want to just think through that. Where do we find the fulfillment? Keep your finger, please, in Leviticus, but go to Acts chapter two and verse one. You don't have to look too hard to get fulfillment for this one. It says in Acts 2 and verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, or literally when the day of Pentecost was in the process of being fulfilled. In other words, the type in Leviticus is actually finding its fulfillment in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. So as we think about that, we want to just think through the previous feast quite quickly. But we want to just say this, that the Son, God the Son, the Lord Jesus, honored the Passover by his death. He became Christ, our Passover, that was sacrificed for us, right? So he honored that festival, and he died on Passover, AD 33, Friday. Uh, he died on Passover, Fulfilling that with pinpoint accuracy. The Father 
honored first fruits by raising Christ from the dead. So he was the, the first fruits, right? So God the Father honors the feast of first fruits by raising Christ from the dead. And God the Holy Spirit honors the feast of weeks or Pentecost by descending upon the waiting disciples in the upper room. And so you've got, as it were, the divine authentication, if you like, of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, showing the fulfillment of these types in very uh, perfect ways. And we honor the Feast of Unleavened Bread through our lives by feeding on the person of Christ and removing leaven from our lives. And so we've got God's involvement and we have our involvement in the Feast of Unleavened Bread by feeding on Christ and being serious about dealing with sin, removing leaven from our lives. So notice the divine order. Passover, the death of Christ. Uh, unleavened bread, I suppose, would be connected with the burial of Christ because, uh, you know, kind of leaven is corrupting. And, uh, of course, uh, God did not allow, allow his son to see corruption. He was buried, but he, what, there was no corruption in him. And so unleavened bread, burial of Christ, first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, the feast of weeks, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just make a, a, a kind of fairly dogmatic statement here, and that is this, that just as we don't need another Passover or another Calvary, we look back and remember it, right? We don't, we don't, there's not going to be another, he died unto sin once, once for all, right? Same way, we don't need another Pentecost. The Spirit came once on the day of Pentecost. No second Pentecost. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need continual fillings of the Holy Spirit. He came into the waiting disciples in Acts chapter 2, and we'll kind of look at the fulfillment of that in a moment. But I want you just to notice Acts chapter 4 for a second. In Acts chapter 4, basically the same people that had received the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, you will see that once again, they receive a second infilling. Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And so what we could say is this, that on the day of Pentecost, we all, uh, in a sense, came into the good of the giving of the Holy Spirit. Like, for instance, I wasn't present at Calvary, but the day that I trusted the Lord Jesus, 16th of June, 1981, I came into all the good of what the Lord Jesus did on Calvary. Okay? At the same time, on that day that I was saved, I came into the good of what happened on the day of Pentecost. This, the, the day that I was saved, not only were my sins forgiven, but the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in my life. And the day you were saved, he took up residence in your life. And so every one of us has the Holy Spirit living within them if you're a true believer. In fact, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, another name for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, you're not a fish, you're not a believer. So you either have the Holy Spirit or you don't have the Holy Spirit. And you have all of him because he's a person. You can't have a bit of him because he's a person. So you either got him in his entirety because he's a person, or you didn't get it, one or the other, right? So if you're a believer, you have all of the Holy Spirit. But the question is, does he have all of you? That's really the issue. In other words, are we fully yielded to our indwelling heavenly guest? And when it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's those points or, or times in a person's life where he is fully, completely yielded to the Holy Spirit. And there's no longer self dominating, but the Spirit's dominating that person. He's yielded every area of his life, and he's under and enjoying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And 
D.L. Moody used to constantly pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit. And one of his friends says, uh, why do you keep asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, I leak. <laughs> That's the reason why. And the idea is this, that that self starts to come back in, right? And when self comes in, Spirit of God is grieved and he's not ruling, as it were, in our lives anymore. He's not dominating. We're dominating. And so there are times when we've got to be refilled with the Spirit of God, allow him to fill every area of our lives and have complete control. And so what we're saying is there's, there's never going to be another Pentecost, but there may be numerous occasions in your life where you need to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit to allow him to have complete control of your life. When you kind of took control of the wheel again of your life, and you have to relinquish control and let him take control. And so this is a very important principle we need to understand. So as we look back at Leviticus 23 now, please look back at 23. Uh, and we want to look at some of the salient features of this particular feast. And so notice verse 16. It says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days and you shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. So it was what we would call a Sunday morning, a Lord's Day, when this event took place and, it, uh, and when its fulfillment occurred. And it says at that day, they were to offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. So there's, there's this new meal offering. Now, what is this new meal offering? What is it all about? Because there already was a meal offering in Leviticus chapter 2. Now, what we mean by a meal offering is it was a grain offering, okay? In, in other words, it's an offering of, of flour. It's not an animal sacrifice, okay? It's, it, there's no blood in it. It's meal. It's a meal offering. And the first meal offering is described in detail in Leviticus chapter 2. And it speaks of Christ's perfect humanity, Okay, and I'll explain some of that in a moment, but that, that just take my word for it right now that the meal offering is really about the Lord Jesus in the perfections of his humanity. The one who died on the cross was a perfect person, the perfect specimen of humanity in every way. No, as we saw yesterday, no sin in him, uh, no coarseness in him. Uh, and often, that, see, the, just I'll, I'll jump ahead, but the meal offering was made of fine flour. And the idea was there was no coarseness or rough edges in it, right? It, it had had all of all the coarseness was ground out, and it was lovely and even, and it was lovely and smooth, finest flour. Okay, and and the problem with you and I is there's a lot of coarseness still in us, right? Anybody here still got a few rough edges? It, it's and it takes a lifetime for the Lord to as it were, smooth off these rough edges in our lives, right? They're still there. And yet in the Lord Jesus, there was no rough edges. Perfectly smooth. You know, he, he was the smooth man, if you want to put that. I don't mean that in the wrong way, but there was, it was perfect evenness, perfect balance. I'll give you an example. A perfect example, I think. The Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. Right? Now, I, oh, through the years, my experience, personally, there's been times when I've been all grace and no truth, and other times I've been all truth and no grace. And I struggle between those two extremes, right? Sometimes I'm, I'm zealous for the truth, and I can be a bit ungracious. <laughs> and other times I'm really gracious, but I, I forget the truth, you know, compromising truth. And yet the Lord Jesus had both of those things <laughs> held in perfect proportion and perfect balance. He was full of grace and truth. No unevenness, no roughness, no coarseness, perfectly even. So that's the original meal offering, and it speaks of Christ. The second will speak of the bride of Christ, his church. Okay? Now, the Old Testament... The church is only found in type. It's not ever mentioned. Actually, the first time the word church is mentioned in our Bibles is in Matthew 16, verse 18. Uh, Upon this rock I'll build my church, right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
right? So, so that's the first time it's mentioned. I will build my church. It's after the rejection of Christ by Israel, calling him demon-possessed. Peter confesses, confesses that he's the Christ, and upon this confession, the law says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so it, the Old Testament only has types or pictures of the church, and this is one of them. And it's a beautiful picture of what God is going to introduce. He's going to introduce something new on the day of Pentecost. A new meal offering is about to be introduced on the day of Pentecost. So what is this new meal offering? What does it look like? Well, verse 17, it says, you will bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So on that day, this new meal offering was comprised of two separate loaves, and they were baked with leaven. Now, it's in, when you look at the meal offering, the first meal offering, Leviticus 2, it was always to be offered without leaven, right? Because leaven pictures what? Come on, were you listening yesterday? Sin. Sin, okay? And when we're looking at the meal offering as a picture of the perfect humanity of Christ, in him is no sin, okay? Now, this new meal offering is baked with leaven, okay? Now, when you think of Christ, we see no sin. When you think of the church, any sin there? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> yes, there is, right? If you don't believe me, hang around Christians long enough, you'll get it, right? There's still sin in the church, okay? And so leaven was to be offered in these two loaves. But it's considered one offering. Notice it singular, a new meal offering, but it's comprised of two loaves. It's not two offerings, it's one, but it's one offering made of two loaves. Just like uh, on the Day of Atonement, there was one sin offering that was to be offered, but that one sin offering were two goats, one that died and the one that went into the wilderness, but it was one sin offering, but the two goats, right? So one meal offering made of two loaves. And so what he's saying is this, I believe this is what the picture is saying, is God is going to introduce something new. And he's going to take two loaves and accept it as one. And God is going to take two divided peoples, the Jew and the Gentile, and put them together in one new man, which is the church. Okay, that's what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. That's exactly what God did. That's what's unique about the church is that you have Jew and Gentile in one body, two previously divided groups with much hatred, antagonism between them, right? Uh, the, the Jews called the Gentiles dogs. And they weren't talking about pedigree pooches. I want you to know that. They're talking about mutts of the highest order, mongrels, right? That's how they looked at them. We're the thoroughbreds, they're the mutts. But God was going to take these two previously divided groups. He's going to unite them together in one new man. I'll never forget being in Ireland many years ago, breaking bread with an old Jewish man. We used to love to hear him pray. Just delightful. But in that assembly, this, this, this child of Abraham had no advantage over me, a Gentile at all. We were on complete equality in this one body. It was a remarkable thing. He had no advantages over me. It was nice to hear him pray because, because I just had, he had a great grasp of the Old Testament, but no real advantage in the presence of God over me. And so in the church, here we are, God has brought together two and made them one. Just look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, look at Ephesians. Keep your finger in Leviticus. We're going to come back there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 16. Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, 
who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive gate. Yeah, I turned over two pages there rather than one. Verse 12, sorry. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, listen to this, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off and made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And so God introduces something new on the day of Pentecost. That something new is, is, is this new uh, thing that delights God, in a sense, where he's brought together two previously divided people into one new man, the church, the, the introduction of this new people, this heavenly people of God. Also, um, this one new man uh, in the, the, that's what we're going to say is the church that's introduced, this new thing that's introduced on the day of Pentecost. We said that in this loaf, there's leaven. And, and again, we, we acknowledge this, that in the church, there still is sin. If you're looking for perfection in the church, you're ahead of schedule. There, there is a day when the church will be perfect. He's going to present himself a perfect bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But, but we have to wait till the rapture for that to happen. But until now, until then, you're still going to see sin in the church. So, you, so there's times when Christians are going to disappoint you. And if they haven't already done it, they will. Because they still have sin. Right? We all do. We disappoint ourselves, don't we? Right? And yet, it's also made of fine flour. You remember what we said about fine flour? What's that picture of? Christ. So we should expect to see something of Christ in the people of God, too. And we do, don't we? Mm. We see Christ-likeness in different saints. It's things that, that about their lives that remind us of the Lord Jesus. And so this is what God is doing, introducing this new New man taking two and making them one. Now, the other interesting thing, I want you just to look for a second in the book of Deuteronomy. Again, keep your fingers in Leviticus 16 because we're going to keep coming back there. But Deuteronomy 16, verses 9 through 12. Again, it's speaking about the day of Pentecost. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn, and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according to as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy main manservant and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And so what we learn from that section is that the day of Pentecost was a day of unprecedented joy. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God. You, your manservant, your maidservant, the Levite that's within you, in those... Everybody, this is a time for joy. And of course, the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost introduces joy into a scene of sorrow, doesn't it? After all, the Lord says that he's going to send the comforter, right? And the fruit of the Spirit is, can anybody tell me? Love, Love joy. Joy, peace. right? I got that joy, 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 joy down in my where? <laughs> well, how did it get there? It's the joy of the Holy Spirit, right? So the day of Pentecost, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and there's unprecedented joy because the Lord has left them 10 days earlier, and, he, and they feel a bit orphaned, and he sent 
another just like himself to come and live within us and to comfort us and to fill our hearts afresh with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory. And one of the evidences of the spirit-filled life is joyfulness. And we should be joyful, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. anybody on this planet should have joy, it should yeah. be us. And it's the joy of the Holy Ghost. And so it, it was a time of great joy. <clears throat> now again, uh, back in Leviticus 23, the number two in the Bible has significance. It, 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 it often speaks of weakness in testimony, where two or three are gathered in his name. There am I in the midst. It's kind of the minimum requirement, isn't it? You, gotta, you, can't, you can't have a church if there's just one. It's, it's two or three, right? Testimony must be given in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? And so it speaks of weakness. And, and there, the church often continues a testimony in the world in weakness. But nevertheless, uh, despite uh, weakness, much weakness, it still is left on this earth to testify to the Lord Jesus in his absence, even though marred by sin, were to be a testimony to the Lord. Also, <clears throat> notice it's a first fruits again to the Lord. Again, the end of verse 17, it says, they are the first fruits unto the Lord. And this is the first fruits connected with the wheat harvest. Uh, we just said the first first fruits, uh, feast of first fruits, which would be a uh, type of the resurrection of Christ, was the barley harvest. In Exodus 34, just keep your finger in Leviticus, but let me just read one verse from Exodus 34 and verse 22. And it would say this, thou shalt observe the feast of weeks and the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So this is another first fruits, another harvest festival, and it's a first fruits of wheat harvest. And so, so again, just this principle of first fruits. And it's true, isn't it? The New Testament talks about us in James chapter 1, verse 18, that we're kind of a first fruits of his creatures, right? The new birth makes us a first fruits of what God is ultimately going to do, the, the millennial kingdom, nobody will ever enter in there unless they're born again. Unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. And God's got a first fruits now of what he intends to do more fully in the kingdom age. And that is in the church, where the kind of first fruits of his creatures in James 1 verse 18. Uh, it's a first fruits. I want you to notice, too, that there were a lot of uh, offerings that were to be offered on that day, uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, verse 18, you'll offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year. This is back in Leviticus 23. And one young bullock and two rams, they shall be for burnt offerings to the Lord. And their meal offerings, so meal offerings as well, and their drink offerings, and an offering made by fire of sweet savor to the Lord. And you'll offer two kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. So there are all these different offerings that were to be offered on that day. And what it's really telling us is this, that the church stands, because all these offerings speak of the person and work of Christ. And we basically, our standing is based on the person and work of Christ. Where our, our acceptance before God, our acceptability before God, is not based on our performance, but it's based on the Lord Jesus and, and his perfect life his perfect death, and the different offerings that are represented here. And so we stand, a company standing in the good of all that Christ has wrought for us by his death upon the cross. And isn't that wonderful? Like today, here we are, we're a group of saved sinners that have a perfect standing before a holy God. And what are we, what's our standing? We, I stand in the merits of Christ my Savior, right? I have no other merits to which, in which to stand. I don't have any merit. All the merits that I have in the presence of God is that I'm accepted in the beloved. Amen. So, so our standing as a people is based on what Jesus did on Calvary. That, that's the standing we have. 
And, and what a standing it is. A company standing in the good of all that Christ has wrought by his death on the cross. Of course, the peace offering implies fellowship because of the work of Christ. Remember the peace offering, that was the one offering that the offerer got to eat, the priest got to eat, and God got his portion as well. And the picture is this. What do you and I have in common with God in heaven? He's holy, we're sinners. Like, we don't have a lot in common, do we, really? The one thing we have in common is we're in love with the same person. He loves his son. We love his son. And we can have fellowship around the person of Christ. I come to the Father and I say, I want to tell you something. I think your son's lovely. And you can just imagine the father's chest sticking out. If you can just forgive this, you know, and the, the buttons on his waistcoat popping. Yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> I love him too, right? And so here we are. We're on this common ground where we can actually enjoy communion with God based on something common we enjoy. We both love the son. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. And so, so again, this is, this is the church. A group of people that are brought into communion with divine persons. Fellowship with divine persons. And it's a wonderful thing. Now, we want to quickly move on because um, we've got another festival to do. And, but in between the festivals, I want you to notice it says in verse 22, and when you reap the harvest of your land. You see, the Jews were an agricultural pe people, weren't they? This is before they were taken into captivity. They were primarily an agricultural people. And you can't be on holiday all the time. I know we'd love to be on holiday all the time, but you can't, right? Sometimes you got to go back to work. So they had these spring festivals, and then they're going to have the fall festivals. But in between the spring festivals and the fall festivals, there's a harvest to bring in, right? Because you, you just can't. Be on holiday all the time. And so you got to work. And that means bringing in a harvest. So what, what we've got here is this. After Pentecost, the next festival is the blowing of trumpets. So what we're supposed to do between the day of Pentecost and the day that we hear the trumpet sound, what should, what should the church be doing between the giving of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and the blowing of the trumpets. Yes. Bring it in a harvest, right? It's the harvest. Lift up your eyes, look on the fields. The fields are white and ready to harvest. And our responsibility now, after Pentecost, waiting to hear the sound of the trumpet, is we've got to be out there, reapers in the whitened harvest. And the Lord says, pray, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he might thrust out laborers into his harvest. And then there's a very sad verse in Jeremiah 8.20. It speaks of a day coming when people are going to say, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. Jesus said the night comes when nobody can work, right? But now we can work before the night comes. So we've got to be about the harvest. And it's important to see where we are in terms of God's calendar. We're after Pentecost, but we're before trumpets. So what should we be doing? Harvest time. That's what it, that's what, this is the time. The time is now to reap the harvest. And we keep on working and we keep on reaping. And the only time we can give up working is when we hear the sound of the trumpet. And then we're done. So what are we going to do today? We've got to reap in the white, whited harvest. So I want us to now think for a moment, please, about the Feast of Trumpets. Now, when we look at uh, these festivals, from verse 23, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month. So now we've, we've gone. Um, basically, the first uh, festivals uh, were in the first month that even was the Passover. 
and and uh, so so now we're we're gone down to the seventh month, so it's in the autumn or the fall of the year, and it says um, in verse twenty-four, speak to the children of Israel, saying, the seventh month, the first day of the month, there shall be a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You do no servile work there. It was works over now. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, I want to suggest to you that when we look at these following three feasts, trumpet, day of atonement, and then tabernacles, the primary application of these three festivals is to the nation of Israel. Okay? The primary application, uh, the interpretation of these festivals is to Israel. There is spiritual application to the church, and we'll talk about that. And so we're going to look at it from two perspectives. Okay, what does it mean to Israel? And then what will it mean to the church, these festivals? First thing I want to say is concerning Israel, there really is a Jewish problem in this world. It's a problem. And in fact, it's a threefold problem. That the nation of Israel face. The first problem that the nation of Israel face is that they're a scattered people. They're still a scattered people. Now, we know that there's a partial ingathering, but as far as I know, uh, there's at least as many Jews outside of Israel as there are in the land of Israel. So they're still a scattered people. They're also a sinful people. Just like we are, but they're, they're, they're guilty of a very specific sin, and that is they rejected their own Messiah. And so as a result of that, they're a scattered people, they're a sinful people, they're a suffering people. And you know their history. Uh, it's, a, it's a history of suffering since A.D. 70 when the Roman general Titus destroyed the temple and the Jews were scattered and almost every nation, they have suffered in some measure at the hands of, of Gentiles. And so how's that Jewish problem ever going to be solved? Well, it's going to be solved when these three festivals are fulfilled. See, the Feast of Trumpets is going to connect to the regathering of that nation he's going to bring his scattered people back again the day of atonement is going to be to do with his sinful people god is going to on that day cleanse these dirty people from their sin when they look on him whom they pierced and then the tabernacles will deal with the issue of the suffering people. Israel, instead of being the heel of the nations, will become the head of the nations, and their suffering will be over. So these three festivals are, are ultimately, I mean, every American president's tried to deal with the Jewish problem, and every American president has failed and will fail, because God is the only one who can solve the Jewish problem. And he's going to do it. And he's going to do it well. Yeah. And he's going to use these three festivals in order to do it. So as we consider the Feast of Trumpets, I want to look at the book of Numbers for a moment, in chapter 10. And I want to think about the significance of trumpets for a moment in Israel. Remember that in the wilderness, there was two to three million people. And they were wandering around in the wilderness. And have you ever imagined how God ever got their attention? You know how it is here. Like I noticed somebody rings some buzzer or bell or something, you know, to get you guys to be where you're supposed to be at the right time. You don't have a trumpet, but you've got a, this, whatever it is, bell or something, right? I, I've heard it a few times, right? right. So, so it's the same principle. How is God going to get the attention of two to three million people? Well, he's going to blow some trumpets. Just like in the olden days, before modern technology of walkie-talkies, how were militaries directed? 
Go by the bugler, right? You remember the bugler had certain bugle calls. And the bugle calls were, were tell them, advance, retreat, hold the line, whatever. There was there were different calls for different actions, weren't they? In on the bugle. Am I right? I mean, they did that in the American Army too, I'm sure, because everything was copied on the British Army anyway. So <laughs> poor copy, but I mean they tried. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? So 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 trumpets. So notice trumpets is God's method of communication uh, to, the, to this nation in the wilderness. And the four specific areas, the calling of assemblies, look at verse two. Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece. This is Numbers 10, verse two. Shalt thou make them that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journey of the camps. But if God wanted to call an assembly, like a, a convocation, bring them together, like the festivals. How did they come together for the festivals? Well, they'd wait till the trumpet sounded and they would tell them it's time to come together in this convocation or well, this festival, right? It was a blowing of a trumpet. God wants to say something to the nation. He'd blow the trumpet, get them together so that Moses could address them. And so the calling of an assembly and then the journey of the camps. It's time to break camp where we're moving out of here. We're on our way somewhere else, right? They blow the trumpet. Time to pack up your tent. We're moving on. Let's go. Verse 9. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. So it was an alarm for danger and to announce war. Verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpet over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifice of peace offerings, sacrifice of your peace offerings, that they may be for your memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So they were to do it in their special days of gladness, like their holy days or whatever. Uh, it was to announce special days in the calendar of Israel. The trumpet would sound. So when... The day of trumpets finds its fulfillment. What's going to happen is God is going to blow the trumpet. And that trumpet sound is going to regather the nation of Israel. And he's going to say to them, I have a special assembly. I want you to come together. He's going to say, to them, break camp wherever you are. I want you to come back. And they're going to listen and they're going to come back. The whole nation going to come from wherever they are in the globe they're going to come back he's going to bring them back they're they're, they're breaking camp uh they're coming to an assembly it's also a sounding alarm for danger announcing war because the tribulation period is going on at this time and also for israel it's going to announce special days are up ahead for them as well so let's look at how this is finds its fulfillment Look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And I believe that that trumpet will regather the nation of Israel. And guess when I believe that will happen? On the Feast of Trumpets. Just as Christ, right? When did he die? On Passover. When did he rise? On first fruits. When did the Holy Spirit descend? On Pentecost. When will Israel re be regathered as a nation? On the Feast of Trumpets, right? It'll all be in sequence. This calendar will be fulfilled exactly. A couple of other references Isaiah 27. Just look there, please. Isaiah 27 of Israel being regathered by the trumpets. Isaiah 27, verse 12, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and you shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. And they shall come, which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. The people ready to perish will hear that great trumpet blown, and they'll come that were ready to perish to the holy mount in Jerusalem. Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, and from Shinar, from Hamath, from the islands of the sea. She'll set up an ensign for the nations. She'll assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So God is going to, a second time, this is not coming back after the Babylonian captivity, a second time, he's going to regather his scattered people. He's going to bring them together. One hymn writer puts it this way, the scattered sons of Israel's race, that trumpet sound shall bring back to their land to know and own Messiah as their king. What about for us? See, we're also waiting for a trumpet. Now, I don't believe it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets that the rapture will occur. Because we're not Israel. And if, if it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets, it would take away the imminency of the coming of Christ. In other words, every year, you'd be waiting until September. And if it didn't happen in September... You can kick back and relax and say, okay, I don't have to worry about it because he's not going to come until next September. But we don't know the day or the hour, do we? It could be at any moment. It could be this morning. We may not even get to the Feast of Tabernacles because it could happen now. That would be something, wouldn't it? Amen. What a way to end the conference. Huh? <laughs> Study the Feast of Trumpets, the trumpet sounds, and we're gone. Out of here. But let's just say this. Based on Numbers 10, I think there's some great principles. When the trumpet sounds for the rapture of the church, it's going to be the calling of an assembly. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Is that going to be an assembly? Oh, what an assembly that's going to be. All the saints of all the ages, since Pentecost to the rapture, will gather together in an amazing assembly. It's also a symbol of breaking camp. We're out of here, right? Your tent pegs, however deep they are in Lincoln, Nebraska, are coming up. <laughs> You're gone out of this place. Yeah. We're going home. Mm -hmm. We're off. It's also an alarm for war. Not for, for us, in a sense. Our battles are done. But when we're out of here, war is going to break out down here. It's the signal that the tribulation period is about to begin. It's also a calling of a solemn assembly. Because after the rapture, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's going to be solemn. We're going to give an account for the things done in this body, whether good or worthless. And so what a day that's going to be. The trumpet sound. The application to the church. The interpretation to the nation of Israel. And God encourages, as we consider Pentecost, God introducing something new, the rapture or the regathering of Israel, the Feast of Trumpets. Amazing things, but we've two more festivals to do, but we need a break in between. Let's pray. Father, we're just thankful for thy word and helping us in some measure to understand your calendar. Help us particularly, O oh Father, to be gripped by the idea that right now we've got to know our time on your calendar. What's the time frame we find ourselves in? Well, we're after Pentecost, that's for sure. And we're still waiting to hear the sound of the trumpet. So what are we supposed to do as far as your calendar is concerned? Is we're supposed to be involved in bringing in a harvest. 
Lord, would you help us to be good reapers in the whitened harvest and to see the need of the hour to be about your business? And we pray for the empowerment, the filling of the Holy Spirit so that we can be effective workers in the harvest. We ask it in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus, who is worthy. Amen. Amen.